Hi, I'm Ken Fogel, and I'll be your instructor in 420.517, the Software Applications Project in Java. In this video, we will review the software that you need to install on your personal computer. Also, there is a set of PowerPoint slides that also details the installation. The combination of the PowerPoint and this video should ensure that you can set up your computer successfully. One important point is that you do this setup now. Do not wait until you have actual tasks to perform. There have been semesters where students have come to me in week 10 and 11 to inform me that they still don't have their software running on their personal computers. Let's not have that happen to us. Please install the necessary software so you're ready as soon as possible to work in our course. Now, let's take a look at the software we're going to use. Before we begin downloading and installing software, if you have a Windows machine, we have a little preparation to do. I'll talk about Mac and Linux once we're finished this preparation, if that happens to be your computer. We're going to create two folders in the root of a drive. Here we can see my drive C. In your case, you could do the same operation on a D or an E, wherever you had sufficient space to install the software we're going to use and the projects that we're going to create. So I'm going to create two folders in here. The first folder will be called DevApp. D-E-V-A-P-P. This is the folder where we will store our uh, development tools. It is necessary to make changes or edits to some of the tools that we use. By allowing them to be installed in the traditional location of program files, we would need administrative level access to make any changes. By creating a folder as a regular user and placing the software we wish to install in this location, we will be free to make changes without requiring elevated privileges. Some of the other software we use can successfully go into the traditional or standard locations, but some we'd really like to be in DevApp. The second folder we're going to create is called Dev. This is simply the folder where I am advising you to store all of your uh, source code, the sample code that I give, and anything that you're working on. I recommend against, for Windows users, to use your home drive location, which is buried inside of uh, C users, your login name, and goes on and on and on. By having folders at the root level, it becomes a lot easier for us to work. And since I know where your software is, I can provide you with better assistance. Now, in the world of Mac and Linux, they take a very different approach. In those operating systems, every user gets their own space and is not able to see other space or interact with other parts of the system. So the default install locations when on a Linux or Mac are suitable, are sufficient. We don't have to create special folders for them. Having said that, you could still use the dev app and the dev folder layout in your home directory if you find that would be easier to use. So now we're ready to get going. You're a Windows user. You've made these two folders. You're a Mac user. You've just been listening, listening politely. Let's move to the next stage, download and install software. There are numerous places where you can download Java. At one time, you downloaded Java from Oracle, but today you have a number of other locations from which you can download Java. What's interesting about all these locations is that the core code of Java is identical in all of these versions. 
I recommend getting your Java from the website adoptopenjdk.net. This particular distribution provides us with installers for all the major operating systems and is now part of the Eclipse Foundation. This ensures that this distribution will be maintained and supported going forward. Now you can see here that there are three versions of Java that can be downloaded from this site. 8 and 11 are LTS or long-term support versions and 14 is currently the latest version. We'll talk in the lectures about why there are multiple versions, but for our course this semester we want to use OpenJDK 14. So now that I've selected 14, I can see here that my latest release is JDK 14.0.2 plus 12. That final number just usually describes minor corrections or fixes. Whatever version we start with, I can assure you we will stay with through till the end of the course. Next semester, when we do enterprise programming, unfortunately we will have to downgrade to JDK 11 as the web and enterprise libraries have not been updated past version 11. So I'm going to click on latest release and this will now bring me to my save my work. It recognizes that I'm on a Windows system. If you were on a Linux or a Mac, you would get a slightly different display. Now you've noticed I've already downloaded these programs, so I'm not going to have you sit here and watch me download them. Instead, I'll call them up and run them directly from my download folder. So here we are, number 14, double click, and the installation begins. First it will verify I have sufficient space. Let's hit next. Let's promise to be nice people and respect the general public license. We are using an open source version of Java. Now, here's where we can do some configuration. And there's only one item here that we wish to change. And that is setting the Java home variable. A number of tools use Java home to determine what version of Java is the default version on your computer. For our work, I'd like you to set the default to 14. If you choose not to, then be careful when using some of the tools that they are configured to use 14 and not 11 or not even 8. I'd even go so far as to recommend that you actually uninstall every version of Java you have on your machine currently and then reinstall starting with 14 and possibly 8 as well, or excuse me, 11 as well. Only set the Java home variable for 14. So I'm going to select entire feature and this will ensure the installation that I want. The default location is in program files. That's fine because we will not be editing the Java configuration in its directory. Ah, it seems to be happy. Let's hit install and hopefully this won't take too long. So while this is going on, a little background on Java. A number of years ago, Oracle decided that rather than being the sole source, they wanted to become involved with, oh, here we go, let's say yes. They wanted to expand the reach of Java. They wanted more companies to be out there providing support to the language. That's why we have a number of distributions. I'm excited to say that our first sponsor for DOSCon is from one of those distribution companies called Azul Systems. You'll hear more about them as we get closer to DOSCon. Ah, everything's done. Let's hit finish. Our Java is installed. To verify its operation, I'm going to open up a command window. 
and I'm going to give the command Java dash version. If Java has been installed properly, I should see the Java 14. There it is, is the default version. If you are and you need to use other versions of Java, you can very easily update the system home or the Java home uh, environment variable to point at whatever version you want. This Java home exists on all platforms. Great, Java's ready. It's time to move on to NetBeans. Now it's time to install NetBeans. There are other IDEs that you could use. I know in our program you've probably all used Eclipse. Maybe even some of you took advantage of the free licensing of IntelliJ for students. My preference is NetBeans, and not because I believe it's the best or greatest IDE. My concern is how much support do I have to give my students in using an IDE? And in my opinion, both Eclipse and IntelliJ are actually far too complex, far too feature heavy to make them easy to use in the classroom. When you graduate, you're free, of course, to go on and select any IDE that you perceive makes you a better programmer. We're going to use a format for our projects that ensures that regardless of your choice of IDE, say you've decided to develop on IntelliJ and not NetBeans, or Eclipse and not NetBeans, you will be working with a format that will allow NetBeans to open your code, and all of my sample code will open in Eclipse, IntelliJ, as well as NetBeans. So, you're free to pick whatever you want. I recommend NetBeans. Also, if you are having technical issues with Eclipse or IntelliJ, I will not be able to provide you with the support you might need to get things to work. So, here we are at Apache NetBeans. NetBeans was at one time an Oracle product. Now it's an open source product and looked after by the Apache Foundation. I'm going to pop over here to download. And let's download NetBeans 12 long-term release. We're going to be asked for a mirror. In other words, we're looking for the closest location. In most cases, it guesses quite well. We're going to pick the Apache NetBeans Windows installer. Makes our life a little easier. Obviously, you will pick the appropriate version for your OS. And one last question, where do I want it downloaded? So this is generally whatever it suggests is fine. Notice that this is a mirror, a location here in Canada. Well, just like we did for Java, I'm not going to have you sit through and watch the download. Instead, it's already been downloaded into my downloads folder. Oh, let's find downloads. There it is. And there we have NetBeans. So just as we did for Java, I'm going to double click on it. But here we're going to make a little change. So it started up. And it's configuring its installer. Always some work it has to do. And now it wants to know what we want to install. If I chose Customize, I could leave out any of these. We don't really need PHP, but some of you may want to work with it. So I'm actually not going to change the base install. So I'm going to go Next. Again, like all of these, I have to agree to the license. And an Apache license is one of the widely used open source packages or licenses. Ah, here's where I make one little change. Notice how it says C program files. I am going to replace program files with dev app. 
On the next line, you see that it's pointing to the location where you installed JDK 14. If for some reason it's not, not to worry. You can browse to the location, and now regardless of the setting for Java Home, NetBeans will default to whichever JDK you list here in this particular box. So it's fine for me, so let's go next. Obviously, we'd like it to check for any updates while it does the install. And off we go. Now it's going to go off and look to see if there are any updates. While you use NetBeans, it always checks for an update every time you start it. I strongly recommend that if it tells you there are updates available, that you proceed to install the updates. So, here we go. Ah, seven updates were installed. Everything seems to be ready. I click on Finish. Now, you might think, that's it. We're all set to go. But again, I'd like you to make some changes to the NetBeans environment so that it's easier to manage. And again, this was one of the reasons I wanted you to install NetBeans not in program files, but into the dev app folder. So let's take a look at the changes that I'd like you to make. Before we can start using NetBeans, there are two configuration files that we want to change to make it easier for us to access certain components of the IDE. The first file we have to change, you can see here, it's called NetBeans CONF. So I'm going to right mouse click on it, and I'm going to say edit with Notepad++. If you don't already use Notepad++ on a Windows environment, I highly recommend it as a general purpose text editor. So here we are. This is the configuration file read when NetBeans starts up. If we slide down, I'm going to go specifically to the listing of Windows, and you can, excuse me, not Windows, of Java, and here you can see that it knows where the JDK home is. Our change, though, happens a little higher up when it defines what are called the user directory and the cache directory. Although it's rare, Sometimes it's necessary to empty these directories. By default, on a Windows system, they will be hidden deep inside of your home, app data, local. It's really difficult to find. I'll never quite understand why Microsoft decided to make Windows as confusing as a Linux or Mac system. Regardless, We'd like the default user directory and the default cache directory in an easier to find location. So, what we're going to do, and by the way, you can see these settings in the slides. What we're going to do is we're going to change the location of both of them. We know they're in C. We know we've placed it in the dev apps folder. We're going to simply call this NB. And the first one is the user directory. And we want to indicate that this is for 12.0. And now we can remove the information here. We make a similar change to the reference to the cache directory. So here we change this to C. It will also be dev app, nb, 
This is the cache directory. And we can leave it as 12. An interesting thing you may or may not be aware of is in many situations on Windows, it doesn't really matter whether you use a backslash or a forward slash. Not always the case, but in most cases it doesn't matter. With these two changes made, I'm ready to save this file. Now we're done with our editing. Let's go and locate the second file that we want. You can see all the directory structure here for NetBeans. We're going to go into the Java section. And in the Java section, we're looking for Maven and the CONF, the configuration folder. I wish to edit the file that says settings.xml. Right mouse click, again edit with Notepad. Here there's only one change to make. We want to define the location for the Maven repository. Maven is a tool that will download and store on our local hard disk any external libraries that are not part of Java. It's one of the things that allows us to write projects that will run on Eclipse, IntelliJ, or NetBeans. Notice that there is actually no command or line that defines this location. We can see that the default is going to be in your user home, M2, repository. So let's create an entry by copying this commented out version. We can paste it down here. Notice it's changed its color to tell us that it's now valid. We want to use the first part of this description, M2 and repository. We'll stick this in here. And we will proceed it with C colon, we're using forward slashes here, dev app, and now we have the location where our repositories will go. Again, it's not often, but from time to time you may want to clean out a repository or examine it directly for its contents. Placing it in dev apps simply makes it easier to find. I'm going to say save. We can close this up and we're ready to use NetBeans. The next program we wish to install is called Scene Builder. Scene Builder is, as you can see from the illustration, a graphical user interface for creating graphical user interfaces. Another product originally developed by Oracle, now open source, and the lead developer for Scene Builder is a company called Gluon. Let's select Download Now. Here you'll see a number of versions. Although it says Download Scene Builder for Java 11, the fact that we are using Java 14 will be fine. The Gluon versions are tied to the long-term support versions, not the in-between versions. So, Scene Builder, I want Windows Installer. Obviously, if you're a Mac or Linux, you'll pick an appropriate one from this list. And let's say Download, and in a few moments, this file will be downloaded. Let's not wait for it. Instead, let's go right to the install. There we have it. There's Scene Builder. I'm going to double click it. I'll tell you now that we will accept every default for the installation. Double click on it. Yes, I accept whatever they want. Install. It's not a particularly large program, so it should install quickly. Ah, here it comes. There is one thing we will do. A couple years ago when I started using Scene Builder, I was concerned that the installation didn't allow you to select 
the location of the program. I contacted the developers and they very kindly changed their installer to give us that option. However, they took away that option when they made the decision to install Scene Builder in the Program Files folder of your machine. We want to get it out of there. I'm going to say Finish. Now I'm going to go to the folder it was installed in, which under Local Disk, Program Files, and we should see Scene Builder. Here it is. We're going to cut it out of this location and paste it into Dev App. Yes, because we're taking it out of a system folder, it needs permission. And now Scene Builder is in place. Let's move on to MySQL. Now it's time to install MySQL. It's easy to find the website, mysql.com. Here we are. And we're going to select Downloads. From Downloads, we'll see a number of choices here. We're not interested in the Enterprise version. This is the version which Oracle, the owner of My MySQL, would require payments for you to, pay, to give them if you use this in production. So instead, I'm going to slide down where I can find the open source version of MySQL down here. I'll select it. Now I'm given a, a number of choices. Clearly you will pick the version that matches your system. They know I'm a Windows machine, so they've shown the MySQL installer for Windows. It would be different, obviously, if you were dealing with a different OS. So, MySQL installer for Windows. We're given two choices here. You can see the difference is significant. One is 24 megabytes, the other one is 427. The difference is, if you download the 24.5 megabyte, the install will download the rest of the code. If you download the 427 version, then it doesn't have to go out onto the internet to download the remaining code. Doesn't really matter to us which one we pick, the installation will look the same. Again, so you don't have to watch a download, let's go to my download folder. Here it is, Downloads, and you'll see that I already have MySQL ready for me to start. We're going to have to pay special and close attention because there are a number of configuration items that we're going to want to change. So, let's double click and start up the installer. You'll notice that I have the full-sized installer. Here we go, the MySQL installer. You have two ways you can install it here. You can go with the developer default or custom. We're going to look at custom only because the developer default installs a number of additional components, primarily for interacting with the Microsoft.NET environment that we don't need and it will just take up extra space on your hard disk. So we're going to select Custom and say Next. Now we have to select which components from the community distribution version we want. We begin by opening up MySQL servers And here we go. It should select the most appropriate version for your operating system. Next, we look at applications. 
There's not much that we need here. Actually, the only one that is significant is the workbench. The workbench gives you a GUI tool for managing tables, drawing entity relationship diagrams, and other cool things you may have seen in other databases. So let's add that. We don't need Excel, Visual Studio, Shell, Router. Move on to connectors. Here in connectors, we're only interested in connector J, which is the necessary libraries for Java to talk to MySQL. Obviously, if you wanted to do C++, .NET, or Python, you could choose those. Finally, what documentation that we want. We like the documentation files locally, so we're not dependent on network access to look anything up. Let's move it over. And we really do want the samples and examples installed on your local server. So there we go. Those are the four components that we want. We'll say next. Everything seems to be ready to install, and we can say Execute. This shouldn't take very long. There we go. Everything is installed. Let's go next. Now it wants to do the product configuration, configure our server and our samples. We'll say next again. We only wish to have a standalone MySQL server. This is not what would be the production server or would it be part of a cluster of servers. So we simply say next. Here we want to know the config type. Development computer is sufficient. All of the settings here can be left as is except for this last one. Show advanced and logging options. You must select this to ensure that we can configure MySQL properly. Now that it's clicked off, I can say Next. Yes, we want to use strong password encryption. This ensures that the Java connector that connects Java to a MySQL database can use the highest level of authentication and our server will use it as well. Now it wants to know our root password. Obviously, you could use anything here. You'd want to use something strong, combinations of letters, numbers, punctuation. Definitely in a production server, a lot of attention has to be paid towards passwords. For our purposes as developers, and so that it is easier for me to interact with your code as I'm evaluating your work, we're going to use an extremely weak password, and that password is going to be Dawson, all in lower case, D-A-W-S-O-N, and then I repeat it. There we go. Now I'm ready to say next. There are no other roles to include. And again, notice that it has recognized the password is weak, but we're interested only in the instructional use of this software. Next, 
how do we want MySQL to run? If I were on a Mac, this particular choice obviously wouldn't be here, MySQL service. Instead, we would find a way to turn on and off MySQL from the Mac system preferences. On a Windows machine, we have two choices for starting up MySQL. We can execute its uh, program file directly, or we can have it running as a service. This is my preference. Configure MySQL server as a Windows service. What I'm going to suggest we unclick is the choice to start the server at system startup. What this means is for you to be able to run MySQL, you will first have to use the control panel services app on your Windows machine and start the service. Every time you turn on your machine, the service will not begin. You can then go to services and turn it off if you've been using it for a while. I'll tell you that I leave my MySQL running all the time because I'm frequently writing and working on software that uses a database. If you have a limited amount of memory, you really don't want it running until you need it. Let's hit Next. Here we're given some information about names for particular log files and so on. There's no reason to change this. The name is going to be based on whatever name your system has. The name you see here is related to the fact that this is my office computer that the college was kind enough to let me bring home to work on. More advanced options. Again, there are, is no need to make any changes here. And now it's ready to perform the configuration. So let's say execute. And you'll see it doesn't take very long for some of the tasks. Right now it's preparing the databases. Then it will start the server. Apply some security settings and there we are. We're done. Here we're told that the configuration is complete. Now it wants to set up our samples and examples. In essence, it wants to execute scripts that will load the sample databases. Here we need our password. We can say, let's check it to make sure we remembered what we just entered a few moments ago, and now we can say next. Execute, and the installer will proceed to verify the original installation and then install the necessary databases. All done. There we go. Configuration is complete, and we don't need to start the workbench now, so we'll uncheck this and say Finish. Now, I had explained that the way in which you will turn on and off MySQL on a Windows machine is to use its services. So here, clicking on the uh, magnifying glass, if that's all you have, or the text field here, you can just type in the word Services. This will bring up the Services app. And if we slide down, it's alphabetical, we should come up to MySQL. Here we are. Notice it's currently running. If I wanted to stop it, I select, right mouse click, and stop. When I'm ready to use it again, right mouse click and start. That this operation of stopping and starting MySQL is functioning properly is our confirmation that our installation has been successful. Let's now finish up by verifying that NetBeans 
is configured properly and we can write a JavaFX program. So we're down to the very last step in ensuring that our software will work for our course. Here you'll notice on my desktop that Apache NetBeans has appeared. Uh, again, depending on your OS, the access to the application may be different. I'm going to double click on it and it should start up within a few moments. There we go. Now, you may be tempted to make other changes here, but first we have to do a configuration. And the configuration occurs when we create our first project. So I'm going to go over to the File menu. And under File, I'm going to say New Project. I have a number of choices here, but you'll notice that Java with Maven is the default here on the left. And we are going to pick Simple. Java FX Maven archetype. What that is, we'll discuss in a later class, but this will create a project with some very simple Java FX code in it. If we can run this project, then we know that our installation is complete. I will say next. Now, we have a configuration issue. There are two choices here. One says NB Java C library. The other one says Java FX implementation. Do not check off NB Java AC. And if it is checked, uncheck it. NB Java AC became obsolete after Java 11. It no longer recognizes newer versions of Java in a timely fashion. We do not require it developing in Java 14. It'll actually get in the way if we do allow it to download. All we need is the Java FX implementation for Windows, so we say download and activate. Now it will go off on the internet. Ah, yes, that's what we want. Next, accept the terms, install. This shouldn't take very long. The necessary plugins will be installed. Ah, we can finish. Here it is now turning on the Java SE feature. And now we continue on defining our project. First of all, this is only a test project, so we don't care about the name, but it's time to get used to changing the project location. We know the project location should be C dev, and let's create a folder in here that matches our course number. Obviously, you can use any folder name you want here. We will learn what the rest of these settings are, and in many cases, we will change them. But for now, it's only the project location. I say finish. And in a few moments, our project will be created. You'll notice down here some files are downloading. This is one of the tools or one of the features that Maven provides us. It's downloading what we need. Ah, there's our program, our very first Java FX application. If I open up Source Packages, open up the name here, this is the first Java program, JavaFX program we're going to run. So, select the project, right mouse click, and pick Run. It will proceed to download some additional files. Once that's complete, it will be able to execute our code.
And there you have it. This very simple program that just consists of a stage with a scene with some text demonstrates, proves that we can run Java FX on our computer. We're now ready to do the coursework. Don't forget to review the slides as well. Combination of the slides in this video, you should be all set. If you have any issues, if you cannot run this, please get in touch with me. We want to resolve this quickly. That's it for now. See you at the next video.